Yes, the death of the medical model and the rise of the pill of Drion uh, is the title of the talk, and I've only got 15 minutes, so it's a, a hard ask, because I'm going to try and convince you all in this short time that the medical model has seen its day. And I should also say right at the start that I'm very pleased to be here after many years of pressing my nose against the World Federation glass. Thank you, President Sean because I, we are now in here, Exit International is in, and we want to start off by delivering this talk about why the medical model has seen its day and needs to be wheeled out with the rubbish. So, where's the little arrow? Here. What is the medical model? Well, first term by R.D. Lang, the medical model, but when it's actually applied to end-of-life issues, a privilege granted to patients of doctors who are sick enough to qualify to get help to die. That's what we're talking about. And almost every bit of legislation talked about today fits that medical model. And it was the medical model that I was involved in back in 1996 in the Northern Territory where I administered lethal injections to four of my patients. But the medical model has seen its day and I'll explain why. It's it's changed, it's become an argument, as I often describe, between the four S's. You've got the suffering sick, and I say wheeled out in front of the public, in front of the media. Politicians are invited to feel sorry for these sick people. And the argument against that is the slippery slope. And all of those that oppose it, saying, we're looking at a slope here, and we've got to be cautious. And the argument goes on and on and on. We talked a little bit earlier, we heard about Australia. I know that place well. I'm glad to be out of it. But in any event, in the 20 years that we saw that legislation come in early, and that was medical model law in the Northern Territory, and I supported it in those days, there's been a lot of attempts to get laws in, and the debate goes on. Those who don't want to change and bring in another law, arguing that it's dangerous, and those who want it showing how sick people can get and how much we have to act compassionately and politicians are expected to act. It goes on and on and on, and it gets nowhere. Well, it doesn't get nowhere. Australia had us now a law, we heard about it, and they are proudly saying, because by now, after 20 years and 20 attempts, it's extremely restrictive. There are so many safeguards, it's so safe, it's unworkable. <laughs> and as I often say, you're going to have to be damn near dead to qualify. The most conservative legislation for assisted death passed by the Victorian law. Now I heard people said, well, it's a small step, but a small step in the wrong direction isn't a good move. And I'm reminded of Susan Stephan, the professor from America who wrote the very influential book, Rational Suicide, Irrational Laws, who made the point that once you met, let the medical profession in, once you let doctors in, you might have a lot of trouble getting them out again. <laughs> she made that as a warning, and I think that's what's happened. We've got unworkable laws getting passed. We're patting ourselves on the back saying, isn't this wonderful? But these laws are not so great. They have problems. Let's have a look briefly at the Dutch. Here's an article in the last couple of weeks from Holland, printed in The Guardian. Eminent journalist and editor, Henk Blanken, my death is not my own. The limits of legal euthanasia in that very progressive country, now my home, the Netherlands. And the quote, but when push comes to shove, the patient is not the one who decides on their euthanasia. It's the doctor who decides and no one else. All as we've done is shift the power. The power is now with the medical profession. It's not with you. We like to say it, and we've heard it a lot today, oh, these laws empower patients. No, it doesn't. You are the person who asked for a privilege. Now, a right is not something you have to ask for. It's not something you go and get permission for. A right is a right. You don't have to go and beg doctors for that. He ended up saying that he felt the Dutch euthanasia law is an utter failure. Very strong words, and that was only a couple of weeks ago, and uh, taken up by an academic in the UK who I'm aware I have some dealings with, Kevin Yule who wrote the book, The Liberal Humanist Case Against Legalisation of Assisted Suicide. Calls for suicide assistance is part of the medicalization of society and the inability of people to live or die without state help. 
And as echo echoing what we've just heard from Sylvan, start taking responsibility. And I think that's where Kevin is heading towards. And this very, very important current contemporary topic. This is in the New York Times from yesterday. Some of you will have seen it. Derek Humphrey ran it in his list today. The debate over rational suicide. Yes, I agree with Sylvan. It's suicide. This is rational suicide we're talking about here. And this is the new old age. Americans are increasingly determined to exercise control over their deaths. And this should be considered a reasonable option. So that's where I'm saying the law has come to its natural use by date. Let's put it to rest. Let's move it out. Let's look for something that's better and different. Now, I'm going to quickly now talk about some people that have been failed badly by the medical model, and we've had a lot to do with all of them. Here's the first one. She influenced my life, a French academic. She came along and said, I'm going to die in four years' time. Please help me. I said, what's wrong with her? She said, nothing. I'll be 80 in four years' time. And I said, oh, if you're not sick, I don't think I can help. And she said, what's it got to do with you, doctor? Just because I don't fit your criteria, this is my decision, not yours. All I want from you, doctor, is technical information, technical advice. You've got information, I want it. What drugs work? She got her drugs and she died when she was 80. A lot of publicity, slippery slope, they said. She's not sick. But she was a person who said, it's my right. I make those decisions. Don and Iris Flounders. Don dying of cancer. Iris said to me, I want to die when Don dies. I said, Iris, you're not sick. She said, I've been with Don for 40 years. When he dies, I want to die. Never will she be helped by the medical model. She's a not sick person. She's a well person, made a rational decision that she wants to die. These two, you may have seen about their story, was told in Europe quite prominently in the Dutch media last a few months back. Bev and Affel, they weren't sick either of them. They just said, now's the time to die. They travelled over to Peru and got the drugs quite easily as you can and died together in Peru. Not sick, never would they be helped by the medical model. We've heard a bit about Adam, Adam Mayer Clayton from Canada. Well, I had a lot to do with Adam. Adam was having trouble with the Canadian system, psychiatric young patient, but psychiatric or not, he was a person who had medical capacity. He knew what he wanted, he wanted to die. He was able, after a while, we were able to make sure that he got the right drugs and he took them and died. Here's a couple that I'm having a bit to do with. Ronald Caruso and Peter Braunstein, both of them in prison in the US with life without parole. Both have made contact and said, we want the right to die. This is torture. Incarceration with no chance of relief is a form of torture. We should not be part of it, the state, but the state is in America, and we believe that we should at least be given the right to die, and I fully agree with them. So this, how does one do it? I don't think we can. But do they have that right? I would say absolutely. At least we need to give them the option of leaving this planet. Because it can be dangerous giving people that are going to prison help. Here's the case of Nigel who contacted me and it turned out Nigel was about to go to prison for a long time for murdering his wife. He made a rational decision that death was better than prison. He ended his life. But when I say it can be dangerous, it can be dangerous for the person who talks about these issues because the Medical Board of Australia said that indicates that you are a danger to the Australian public and they decided to cancel my medical registration because you're talking about topics which we don't want to hear about. You can talk about sick people who are about to die getting help, but do not talk about people like Nigel Braley, who's a rational adult making a decision to die rather than be jailed. And I'll finish up with this little run through patients with this person so prominent this year. Many of you will have seen the story. Got help in Basel, life circle. Very thankfully helped this 104 year old who refused to say on his arrival in Switzerland that he was sick. Everyone kept saying, you must be a bit sick <laughs> at 104. But he kept saying, I'm not sick, and I don't see why I should say I'm sick. 
he got eventually the help and we we're very glad that he was able to. These people, none of them will be helped by medical, the medical model. So let's change it. Let's go to a human rights model. Now, everyone's talked about rights, but I'm really meaning this is a right, fundamental right. That's not a privilege. It's not something you ask for. The position is that all, our position is, Exit's position is that all rational adults have the right to a peaceful elective death at the time of their choosing. All rational adults. So you notice I don't say anything about the reason. Not sick, not saying. Now, I am not just dream this up. I mean, people have been talking like this for a long time. Go back a little bit, the philosophers Spinoza and Nietzsche talk a lot about suicide, but this person influenced me, Thomas Sass, the psychiatrist from America. His quote there, suicide is a fundamental human right. The most fundamental right. Life is a gift. What sort of gift can't you give away? That's not a gift if you can't give it away. It's a burden. <laughs> One that society has no moral right to interfere with. And of course, this man, who we've seen mentioned, Hugh Drion, influenced me a lot. I first travelled to the Netherlands in 98 to see Hube. Travelled to his house, he's now dead. And I, had it, I took that photo as he talked to me about his ideas. And of course, you've heard about the Drion pill. We, of course, promptly co-opted the idea, relabeled it the peaceful pill. But the idea is that people should have this option of an elective death for their and them as the only arbiters of who takes this elective step. So this is the end of life model I want. The human rights model, there are only two criteria. You must be an adult. We're not talking about children who don't understand the permanence of death. And the person must have what's known as mental capacity. Now, that's a trickier one, mental capacity. In other words, they must know what they're doing is in, they believe, their best interest. People say, well, doesn't that mean you've got to involve doctors? No, you, no, you don't. Mental capacity. Now, I'll just say quickly here, there have, some, there have been some examples of this rights model. We see some of it in the Swiss model. Swiss model is unique and unusual. And we see it there when you heard it described earlier about a model whereby you can get help as long as there's no financial gain, but there's no reference to sickness. So no reference to medical conditions. So the Swiss model is unique and it tends to move towards this rights model in a way that none of the other models I see around the world does. And the Dutch and the Belgians, as I've heard here today, are looking at this tired of life phenomena. What does that actually mean? How do we go down that? Do we try to say that elderly people must be a bit sick like David Goodall, so we've just got to find out what it is and then we can wedge them into this medical criteria, or do we just abandon the criteria and say, no, if he wants to die, he wants to die, as long as he's of sound mind. And the Dutch idea of maybe completed life, maybe people over a certain age, will be as a right issued with those drugs. Very, I think, progressive thought, and I'll be very interested to see where that leads to. Now, just finishing off then, the problem of assessing mental capacity, people say, surely you need doctors. I don't think so. We all assume to have mental capacity. That's why we're functioning in society. If we're a risk to ourselves, there are laws in place now to take us off the streets and involuntarily incarcerate us. We don't have to try and prove ourselves to be sane, but if you really want to do it, let's not drag in the psychiatrists. We're already one of the projects in New Tech that Exit is looking at is the idea of using artificial intelligence for screening for so-called mental capacity. In other words, are you aware of what you're doing? It's not that difficult and it shouldn't be used as a defence or an argument for involving the medical profession. So what sort of legislative changes do I want? I don't want some smart new law with a thousand safeguards which will codify every possible medical contingency so that everyone who ever wants to die will fit somehow or other into it. I want to go at it from a different route. I want to see reform of the drug laws that prevent personal possession, importation and testing of euthanasia drugs. That's a reform of the drug laws. We're seeing it happen with recreational drugs in very many legislatures. Why not extend it if you can import your own MDMA or your ecstasy or whatever else and use it for personal use, why not be able to import and use and store and test your own euthanasia drugs? 
And I want to see all removal of censorship and restriction on the move of information on ending one's life. And it's currently quite restricted. Information sharing is critical. It's a critical to the rights model because new technologies are coming along and they undermine those who are trying to control death. We published the book, it's been banned in Australia and New Zealand, our book, The Peaceful Pill Handbook, which tells people how it's, a, it's an extension of Derek Humphrey's groundbreaking first book, Final Exit. Digital world is different. We've got encryption, we've got the dark web, and we've got Bitcoin. This is altering and opening up avenues we've never previously seen. Recently, of course, the Dutch made this announcement that they had this new Dutch powder. It's not quite the dream that it sounded like, but it's important. And we'll be talking about it at New Tech tomorrow. About, they were talking about a drug which anyone can get, sodium azide. Now, if anyone can get sodium azide, it's not as good as what we'll be talking about, as was indicated earlier, by Final Exit Network, who are involved in this same work, sodium nitrite. But if everyone can get something to die, why change the law? Yes, and the sarco. Come out and see the sarco. It's our idea of the 3D print liquid nitrogen device to give you the chance of dying electively with elegance and style at the time of your choosing. Come to the New Tech Talk tomorrow, uh, no, Sunday. We're live streaming to the world. And when you're in deep shit, look straight ahead, keep your mouth shut and say nothing.